Hi, and welcome back to Grassroots Crypto, where I like to teach people about crypto. In this video, I'm going to be talking about ThorChain. A lot of people find ThorChain difficult to understand when they first approach it. I know a lot about ThorChain, so I wanted to make sort of like a video series, which is going to be a tour of ThorChain and all the different features and, and services and backend. So first, in this video, we're going to start with the basics. What is ThorChain? What problem does it solve? What makes it special? And have a little bit of a look at Rune. In the next video, we're going to look at the core services of swapping, saving and lending and a bit how they work. And then in the third video, we're going to be looking at some of the features that underpin that like streaming swaps and so on. And in the last video, we're going to get into the real technical details about the ThorChain backend. Whilst I'm going along, I'll be pointing out some of my videos or ThorChain University articles that provide some more in-depth information if you wanted to go ahead and look at that. So let's begin with an introduction to ThorChain for beginners. The concept behind ThorChain is not really complex. Essentially, ThorChain operates as a cryptocurrency exchange, just as you'll swap Australian dollars for American dollars in a traditional exchange, like if you're going to go traveling. ThorChain facilitates the exchange of cryptocurrencies, such as Bitcoin or native Ethereum, which is called Ether. The process is commonly referred to an exchange for obvious reasons, but unlike a traditional exchange, ThorChain lacks a central company or a point of centralization, meaning it is a decentralized exchange or a DEX. ThorChain only uses self-custody wallets, and you can see my video to understand more about what self-custody wallets are, and it is available to use via a long list of interface and wallets. ThorChain is independent, not relying on any price fees or oracles or other third parties or centralized sources. It relies on the market to set asset prices and it is open source, runs on its own blockchain and has an open validator set. But at the heart of ThorChain is its ability to swap native assets. In addition to swapping cross-chain assets, ThorChain also offers a savers product which is akin to a high interest savings account like you would have at a bank. And this enables crypto holders to earn in-kind yield. So if they put in Bitcoin, they're gonna earn Bitcoin. If they put in Ethereum, they're gonna earn Ethereum and so on. And then there's lending, which you can use your crypto to take out a loan with the best loan terms anywhere. That's no interest, no liquidations and no timeframes. So you put in one Bitcoin, you can get half a Bitcoin worth of Tether or Stablecoin, and you don't have to repay that unless you want to get your collateral back. We'll talk more about savers and lending in the next video. Now let's move on to Rune. ThorChain's native token is Rune, and it plays several important roles within the network, such as governance, liquidity, security, and incentives. Rune is most liquid or of the greatest use within ThorChain. ThorChain's design is such that the demand for Rune rises or shrinks in relation to the market. It's important to note that end users never actually have to deal directly with Rune or hold Rune, even though Rune is used in every aspect internally within ThorChain. Rune's total supply was minted on launch and all vesting has expired. All Rune has now been transitioned to native Rune, which lives on ThorChain's own blockchain. Several million Rune, or about 3% of the max supply, was burnt during the transition to native Rune, reducing the overall circulating supply below 500 million. Today, about 30% of the remainder Rune is locked in the reserve or the treasury, and about 70% is in actual circulation. There's a Medium article called Rune Tokenomics that explains Rune more, the roles that it plays, and the importance that it has within the network. If we're being honest, there are many other decentralized exchanges out there and other platforms that offer swapping, saving, and lending. So why is ThorChain so special? Why is ThorChain the first of its kind? So if you're familiar with the crypto space, you can think of ThorChain as a cross-chain Uniswap or a decentralized Binance or Kraken. If this analogy makes sense to you, that's great. You'll get why ThorChain is special. If you don't, let me explain. So let's talk a little bit about swapping and DeFi history. 
A lot of the DeFi happened on the Ethereum chain, and today it happens on other chains like AVAX, Solana, Binance Smart Chain, Polygon, all that type of stuff. But let's just focus on Ethereum, as it's pretty much going to be the same for all the other chains. So before ThorChain, to use Bitcoin on the Ethereum blockchain, so you had some Bitcoin over here and you wanted to participate in the DeFi space or use a decentralized exchange like Uniswap to swap to stables or to swap to Ethereum, you would need to take your Bitcoin and send it to a centralized location for it to be transported over to the Ethereum blockchain. So this company or third party would actually keep your Bitcoin on the Bitcoin blockchain and issue you with a token that represented the Bitcoin that worked on the Ethereum blockchain. So this token was an IRU, which is a promise to pay when you want to reverse the process. So then when you, you're you done participating in the DeFi space and you've done all the swapping, you can reverse the process, take that token back to the third party, and then they would reissue you with the uh, native Bitcoin here. So there are two examples of this. It was Ren Bitcoin and Wrap Bitcoin. And these tokens worked on the Ethereum blockchain and they represented the value of the Bitcoin that was held by these companies. But they're not actual Bitcoin. Because as discussed in my blockchains and tokens video, only real Bitcoin runs on the Bitcoin blockchain. This is a representation that runs on the, on the Ethereum blockchain. It's not the same as this it only holds the equivalent value. So why would people do this? They want to use a decentralized exchange. They want to participate in DeFi and yet they trust their Bitcoin to this third party. It's because there was no other way to move tokens across blockchains. So this is one of two workarounds to move Bitcoin or, or specifically tokens from one blockchain to another blockchain. So the first workaround is wrapping and this is the process that I just talked about. By taking Bitcoin, giving it to this party, they issue with a token that represents that Bitcoin that you've given to them and this is known as say wrap Bitcoin or Ren Bitcoin as well. It's commonly referred to as wrapping. So this introduces risk because it's a centralized party in the wrapping the unwrapping process or really the issuing of the token and then taking back the token when you when you want to reverse the process. So you're trusting them to do this process, hoping that they have the Bitcoin when you want to, particularly when you want to go back from a tokenized version, the IOU version of Bitcoin back to the real Bitcoin. And this is a convoluted process because to swap native Bitcoin to Ethereum, you would need to first do this wrapping process that I talked about, get this IOU version of Bitcoin, then go to a decentralized exchange like Uniswap and, and approve their contract, then conduct the swap, uh, get your wrapped Ethereum, because that would need to be an ERC-20 for the smart contracts to work, and then um, perhaps you need to approve that contract as well if it's, if it's the same, and then do the swap, and then you can go ahead and unwrap your wrapped Ethereum in order to get your native cross-chain swap. Uh, it's convoluted, it's, it's quite expensive, and you kind of need to be a DeFi expert to understand it all. Then the other workaround are bridges, which allows tokens to move across different blockchains, but mainly DeFi chains. Bridges work well to connect DeFi chains, but to use Bitcoin, you'd still usually wrap it first to get, get a tokenized version, and then you could move that to another chain. The issue with bridges are they need to store large amounts of crypto which is usually in a centralized location or a smart contract, and that makes them a really big target for hackers. I'll leave a link in the description below with details, but you're looking at about $2.8 billion in bridge hacks to date. So going back to the question, why is ThorChain different? ThorChain does away with the workarounds by allowing native cross-chain swaps, e.g. working directly with Bitcoin on the Bitcoin blockchain and not a representation or an IOU or a tokenized version of it. It's just a simple case of cross-chain swapping. This makes the process simpler, cheaper, and reduces the risk because you're dealing with the actual assets on the native blockchains, not dealing with representations of it and or an IOU token. So while that's great, the challenge extends beyond this, to be honest. So let's zoom out and take a broader look of the crypto landscape. So just let me explain this picture here. We have kind of like the crypto landscape with all these different ecosystems here. Within each ecosystem, you'll have a decentralized exchange like Uniswap, you've got Sushi here at one inch, and you have all these different tokens. Um, there's obviously PancakeSwap and so on and so forth. And you could put like Solana and you could put other ecosystems here as well. 
Anyway, so they need a way, as we talked about before, to move Bitcoin into the ecosystem, and then that's where they can exchange it with other tokens. Because each ecosystem will have its own blockchain or uh, layer two blockchain, they'll also have bridges to move the value of assets across those different blockchains, whether it be layer one or layer two. Now you can think of these ecosystems, individual islands, they can't move across very easily from, say if you wanted to take FRAX over here and then swap that with USDT, it's not gonna be an easy process because you have to go across ecosystems. So that's why ecosystems build within themselves because it's just so much easier to do that than it is to try and work with other ecosystems. ThorChain, on the other hand, uses native assets. So it eliminates the need for these workarounds and enables a seamless transfer of assets between ecosystems. So in this way, ThorChain joins the ecosystems together instead of being one ecosystem on its own. So you can move, if you've got Frax here, you can move that to AVAX, convert that to Ether, and then you can do a swap on Uniswap here. This can be done in individual steps or it can be done via the aggregation pattern where a, a UI like ThorSwap or stuff like that will actually do the whole process for you. It's pretty cool, hey? So that's a very basic introduction to ThorChain. I hope you found it useful. If you did, please hit the thumbs up and share it with your friends. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button to see the next video in the series where we'll look at ThorChain's core services of swap, save, and lend. In the meantime, if you have any questions, put them in the comments below. And until next time, thanks, bye.